This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions about software engineering topics at least once a month. Thanks to our audience and the partners listed on our website for supporting the podcast. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of Software Engineering Radio. We are recording this one at the OOP or OOP conference in Munich, Germany, January 2011. And um, we are sitting in, in a room that's intended to be used as a quiet area. So there might be other people coming in and being as quiet as we are. Um, I hope they won't disturb too much. Anyway, our guest today is Andrew Brownsert from uh, EA. And I guess you want to introduce yourself first. Hello. Um, I work for Electronic Arts, and I have worked for that company for approximately 21 years now. Um, we're in the video game industry, and we do titles such as FIFA Soccer, Need for Speed, Battlefield, um, and a variety of other titles uh, in a variety of genres. We're a world co worldwide company, and uh, I'm a senior software engineer in the Vancouver, Canada studio. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, it's obvious now what the topic is going to be for this episode. We're going to talk about uh, game architecture and the kinds of games. I'm not sure if everybody knows what these titles actually represent, but these are, let's say, action games, racing games. So can you characterize these kinds of games a little bit? So differentiating them from, let's say, SimCity or something, you know, is there a way of characterizing the kind of games you build? Well, EA actually owns Maxis as well. So we do SimCity ah. and The Sims. <laughs> and uh, uh, our sports label games are um, stadium-based, baseball, football American football and a variety of other titles uh, and that typically the player is in control of a whole team and he can switch mm -hmm. between individuals on the team and get a um, a 3D view and control the player as the player runs around and actually plays the the, the game and scores goals hopefully mm -hmm. um, or whatever else you do in the sport and then we also have titles like uh, Battlefield or Battlefield 1942 or Battlefield Bad Company. And these are more in the what we call the first-person shooter genre. Mm -hmm. And um, they're usually set in wartime or some science fiction genre. And you find weapons and uh, try to achieve mission objectives. Um, we also have the Need for Speed line, which I've been personally involved in uh, for the past several years. Um, and that's racing games and sometimes they are strength sanctioned street racing mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes they are sort of more illicit and there's a storyline involved generally and you know you're an undercover police officer or something <laughs> trying to to break into the mob or something yeah. of that ilk <laughs> um ea has other games like the lord of the rings series mm -hmm. um which is sort of a fantasy role-playing or a what's called um rts real-time simulation mm -hmm. and it's sort of multiple sides fighting epic battles uh, we have also done the harry potter series and games like dead space which is sort of a dark horror adventure kind of genre mm -hmm. so quite a variety and and i guess since you're mostly involved with the need for speed uh, franchise or series i guess most of the things we're going to talk about kind of have a background in this kind of game. So if we don't say anything else, we basically talk about racing games in some sense. Although the, the concepts, of course, are applicable to the others as well. But that's your background. Yeah, my background in the last couple of years has been uh, Need for Speed, and we also did a skateboarding product right. called Skate. Yeah, okay. So um, if we look at these racing games, um, can you give us... I mean, maybe should some say one more thing. You did a keynote yesterday about this topic, and I saw the keynote, so I might, I might kind, might kind of implicitly reference things that I saw in the keynote. Um, so one thing you showed was how these kinds of games have evolved over the last whatever twenty years, from the pixelated, you know, beginning of the nineties to what we have today. Can you give us a little bit of a, you know, kind of timeline regarding I don't know screen resolution, level of detail, how these things changed? Sure. The uh, the state of affairs when I joined the game industry in 1990 
was that the screen resolutions were approximately 320 pixels wide by 200 tall. Um, and to give you some idea on a typical TV or display, you'd be looking at it and you almost have to use your imagination mm -hmm. to realize that this thing in the distance is a car. I mean, it it is very vague and blocky and um, the number of colors we could draw, you know, in the beginning was... Now, on the Macintosh, for example, it was black and white. Mm -hmm. And on uh, on the PC, some of the displays only had 16 colors per pixel. So the, the, the range of colors we could show was very, very limited. And the computational capability of the computers was so limited we couldn't do even 3D graphics. Right. And so we would have pre-drawn 2D sprites mm -hmm. that we would draw on the screen in the correct position. And when the car got car got farther away we would actually switch to a different texture that mm -hmm. was drawn to be smaller uh, and tricks like that. And so the whole thing was an illusion of 2D layers um, displayed on this low-resolution screen, and the audio was, was little better than blips and boops. <laughs> and then uh, shortly thereafter, as machines started to become faster and heavier-duty math became possible, screen resolutions um, slowly started to increase. We moved to 3D... And then a little while later, screen resolutions jumped up. VGA arrived on the screen, and we were then up to 640 by 480. And we usually had enough compute power that we could run at 20 frames per second. And once you get to 20 frames per second, now you start to perceive real motion. Mm -hmm. Previously, at 10 frames per second, it was pretty chunky, and you really had to use your imagination. As you get to 20, and then hopefully 30 frames per second, as you know, movies are at yeah, 24. 24 frames per second, and that is sort of the threshold of where you can see continuous motion. And actually, the, the human perception, you can, you can perceive smooth motion all the way up to around 60 frames per second. Because if I go to the movies and I can see that uh, I watch a 24 frames film and you see rapid movement, I think I perceive incontinuities. It, it kind of feels, it looks chunky a little bit, or is that my imagination? No, you're absolutely correct. Okay. As big pans and stuff yeah. like that happen, you can definitely right. perceive right at the edge of your perception. Yeah. And even the TV speed of, uh, well, the North American TV speed of 30 frames per second, it looks smooth, but when you see a 30 frame per second game versus a 60 frame per mm -hmm. second game, there is a clear difference to most mm -hmm. people. Some people have a hard time perceiving it. We're all a bit different in our visual acuity, right. but 60 frames per second is pretty rock solid smooth for most people. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're shooting for today. So these days there's a trade-off, and usually a game, particular game, has to make a decision. So resolutions have gone now far beyond the 640 by 480. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and at uh, high definition tev television resolution, we talk about the number of vertical lines mm -hmm. and so we've gone from 480 to 720p and now to 1080p. And the frame rates of the TV is 60 frames per second mm -hmm. or higher. Some of them display higher. But we generally can only send a new image to the TV at 60 hertz. And the game has to make a choice because 60 looks a bit smoother, but it's a pretty subtle effect. 30 looks almost as smooth. And if you have twice as much time to render the mm -hmm. frame of the game, you can get twice as much detail into a single frame. So the actual picture might look better, but you get fewer of them. Exactly. So it's a trade-off between smooth motion versus quality of the image. Mm -hmm. Okay. And quite often games will choose quality of the image, and it really comes down to a gameplay choice. Right. Like some games play better at 60 hertz. Mm -hmm. I, actually, I, I saw during the keynote yesterday you, you gave a little demo of the Need for Speed shift i think it was called that's correct and um i have to say i don't follow games that much except for angry birds i guess and flight simulator <laughs> <laughs> but um that was pretty impressive i mean it 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 really the level of detail that went into the rendering especially i mean all these different shades and you, you showed this one slide with you know scratches on the on the car and stuff so th this was it was really impressive so so if you listener haven't played one of these games recently try to i don't know go to youtube and look at one of them make sure it's a hd resolution it's pretty impressive so um anyway so we're going to talk about these kinds of games 
And I guess we, we're going to talk about two or three aspects. One is the, the, the ingredients, so what goes into building one of these games, like you know, simulation, rendering, audio, things like that. And then we're going to look at some of the more current challenges you're looking at, which is concurrency and, and multi-platform. And then you have identified a bunch of patterns that you use when building these systems. We're going to talk about some of these. Okay. So um, let's start with some of the ingredients. And I guess the basis for uh, a game like Need for Speed Shift is obviously the, the simulation that goes on that kind of decides what happens as opposed to how it's shown and how it's you know r rendered in a, in a visual and audio way. So how, how do you go about simulating the, the physics? How exact is it? I mean, is it real physics? Is it all fake? It's definitely not all fake. Um, so underlying the game engine there is a basic physics simulation, and we call it a rigid body simulation. And at that basic level, there's objects in the world, and they're modeled with momentum, and they have um, you know, tensors and, and all these other physical concepts. Mm -hmm. And the simulation is updated at generally 30 or 60 frames per second. Right. Um, and the physics engine is responsible for taking the forces that are applied to the vehicles and any other objects that are moving around, turning those into changes to the vehicle's velocity, mom momentum, and mm -hmm. acceleration, um, and then uh, applying gravity, and then detecting when objects collide together, and then generating reasonable responses when they have these collisions, as well as events like the noises and the, and the particle effects. So the, 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 let's say the math that goes into simulating this are the real physical formulas, but the level you, or the way you have to tune the overall amount of p processing you have to do is basically the, the granularity of the objects. Is that, is that fair to say? Or do you actually do cheats on the, on the way you calculate things? So at the rigid body level that I mentioned, the physics is actually fairly stable. And some EA games, for example, use uh, there's a licensable Havoc a product called mm -hmm. Havoc that is a physics engine you I can am. buy. It's a piece of middleware right. that you can license. And uh, other games use internal, internally developed physics. But the, the key point is at the level of the rigid body, the physics is pretty much actual real mechanical physics, mm -hmm. Newtonian mechanics or whatever. Um, the place where the fudging and the tuning and the, the not quite real physics comes in is in the actual simulation of the vehicle. And it really sits on top of the rigid body physics. And it generates forces to move the, the bodies that are the cars. So you don't simulate the whole engine and the way the, w the, 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 w the tires interact with the pavement. This is more or less uh, approximated. The engine is definitely an approximation. Right. We don't simulate the cylinders or sure. anything like that. So we have curves that we go and we looked at the manufacturer's data curves and we <clears throat> generate a... Um, rough simulation of or a model of that. That's mm -hmm. a fairly high level model. Um, but you mentioned tire physics. On the other hand, we actually have quite sophisticated tire physics models that do. They're not. You wouldn't find a physicist who's working for the automotive industry <laughs> basing yeah. car design on these things. But we are tuning it carefully so that it gives the right feel, um, and it exhibits quite a few of the attributes that actual real tire physics mm -hmm. exhibit. But we don't take it to an extreme. Right. That's for sure. Yesterday you said that uh, fun and a good feeling is more important than actual complete physical accuracy. Absolutely. So it's really key that the player feel like he's driving the real car. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, trying to accurately reproduce the numbers that the real cars get on the track doesn't give that feel. Right. <laughs> Part of the reason for that is because the driver, the player of the game, isn't sitting in his Audi S5 or whatever it is, right. driving around the track, feeling the G-forces, moving him, holding a steering wheel, unless you have a really right. sophisticated game set up. You've got a little gamepad control in your hands. And through that, you are trying to experience racing around the track. Yeah. So it takes a fair bit of tuning, artistic license. And there, there is a, um, there's a real art to defining the feel of a game, to making it feel gritty and aggressive. And at the same time, most game players aren't professional race car drivers, yeah. and we want them to feel successful. Right. So it is a game, first and foremost. In addition to um, the, the car 
and its interaction with the road, you also have to simulate things like how does the car deform if you crash into a wall? And if you accelerate too fast, how does the smoke, you know, leave the, the tires and stuff? This is not really real, right? This is all, this is approximated, these kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely. The The damage is um, designed to return a a good visual look. Yeah. And something that looks impressive, something that doesn't break the illusion of of reality. Yeah. Like the suspension of disbelief is a term we use. Mm -hmm. The the user wants to be in the game playing and if you see something that just looks wrong, like you can see through the polygonal model of the game, of the car, you don't want to see that. So mm -hmm. we carefully deform the models so that we don't break the illusion, but it still looks like a car that got right. seriously crunched. Mm -hmm. In reality, we don't actually do much to the model of the car. Mm -hmm. So even though the front end may have been compressed in by six inches, we probably don't actually move where the collision happens. We don't need to because you can't sure. notice. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and things like uh, particle, how do you say, swarms kind of, you know, if you have many small particles that move together, that, that's, uh, you would use these swarm kind of algorithms where you define, you know, one, where you say you have a bunch of primitive rules how the particles interact with each other and then you would kind of emerge, you know, that the behavior of the small, of the cloud of the particles would emerge from the... Yeah, but you we don't do this for the smoke, probably. It's too detailed. Well, actually, that's not true. We ah. have, we have uh, specialists who their job is to set up these particle systems. Okay. And each of the particle kinds of particle systems has its own set of rules, as mm -hmm. you call them, right? Little algorithms right. that govern the motion of the particles. And mm -hmm. smoke is actually a really important one to get the motion. Mm -hmm. um, I know we've spent a great deal of time working out how to get believable volumetric smoke. And there's different kinds of smoke. Some smoke <laughs> comes out of the tailpipe. <laughs> some smoke comes off the engine after you crashed. Yeah. The, some of the most important smoke in a racing game comes off the wheels. Yes. And it's different whether it comes off the front wheels or the back <laughs> wheels, all four mm. wheels, depending on which, uh, which, engine, uh, which wheels the engine is driving. Right. And so, um, you know, smoke actually curls around the tire as, the, as you burn out. <laughs> and all this stuff has to be modeled. And it's modeled not from physical correctness point of view, yeah. but from a believability right. point of view. Yeah, yeah. And then it's balanced against the trade-off. If you, We can't render an unlimited number of particles, so we have to carefully design them so that they represent a reasonable load to render and yet generate a pleasing effect visually. Yeah. yeah. So let's move on to a <laughs> video presentation to the optics, basically. Um, I guess... One, I mean, one question I could ask initially, I know it's not the case, but I can still ask it. Um, is this ray tracing going on? Is this actual simulation of light rays or uh, what kinds of ways of rendering the actual scene are used? So it's all polygonal triangle rendering and it's, um, it's not ray tracing, mm -hmm. although for some purposes we will trace rays, although usually not for graphics, strangely enough. Mm -hmm. Um, however, um, it's uh, a shaded lighting model, and different games use different techniques. So some of the latest games are using what's called deferred shading, um, and the idea is you you render all your triangles into the world scene, and then you apply lights after mm -hmm. the fact on the rendered result. Um, traditionally, in older models, you would render the polygons, and as you drew each triangle onto the screen, you would figure out the lights that are shining on that polygon and color it appropriately. Mm -hmm. So um, how do I have to imagine actually programming this visualization? Um, is it that developers actually, let's say, draw pixels, or do you have pre prefabricated, pre-rendered sprites, as you called it back in the day? Do you have um, certain patterns that you maybe apply to walls or to the street pre-built? Or how do you, you know, how do you, on, on which level of granularity do programmers who implement the visualization algorithm, how, how, how detailed do they have to actually render each pixel? How does this work? I have no idea about graphics programming, as you probably can notice. So that's... Yeah, so, um, so what we get from the art team is 3D models, which are essentially a cloud of vertices in 3D space. And uh, these vertices are connected by edges, which form triangles. 
And applied to these triangles is a bunch of properties. So lighting information or um, specular information. There's a variety of different properties that describe the, the triangle. And there's a, generally a texture, sometimes quite often a whole layer of textures, some of which are simply the, the 2D visual image that you would see if you were looking at that part. Mm. So you can imagine a brick wall, and it right. essentially is a photograph of a brick wall, and that is drawn onto the triangle. Um, some of the textures are, are not directly physical representations. Things like a bump map will affect how light reflects off the texture so it defines shape so that we can then on the fly calculate how that surface is is interacting with the lights that happen to be in the environment. So with the textures and the models that are produced by the artists, these are fed into the rendering engine and programmers interact with this first and foremost by marshalling them in off disk into main Mm -hmm. memory Mm -hmm. and then arranging for them to get to the GPU so that the graphics processor can actually use that data. And then they are fed into the graphics processor along with what are called shader programs. Mm -hmm. And there's generally two kinds of shader programs. Um, There are new kinds coming, but first what runs on the program uh, on the GPU is uh, called the vertex shader. So every vertex in a triangle is made of three vertices, the three corners. Um, Every vertex gets processed by this vertex shader program. And it does things like takes its, the vertices position in three space, and works out where that's going to get projected onto on the screen. Mm -hmm. And it's going to calculate the normal, which is the perpendicular to the triangle, um, and various other parameters. And these are then passed along to the second program, which is called the pixel shader. Mm -hmm. And the pixel shader gets the inputs from the triangle, and that those are generated by the vertex shader. And a triangle is three of them, and what the hardware does is it interpolates from one mm-hmm, vertex mm-hmm, to the other mm-hmm. along the edge. And so you get an array of pixels once it's rasterized onto the, the frame buffer. Yeah. So, so <coughs> one thing maybe that most people probably know uh, is that the abstractions you work with on the GPU really isn't the pixel. It's, it's these triangles, and there are layers, and there are all kinds of 3D magic going on on the GPU itself, right? So there's not just pixel processing. Yeah, there's both. The, yes. the vertices get processed, and then the GPU does this interpolation magic, and it works out exactly which pixels go into it, and then it runs the pixel shader to actually calculate the color that it wants right. to output at the back end. Yeah. So um, GPUs are actually quite sophisticated today as many of our listeners probably know how much of the work of the overall rendering is done on the cpu and how much what's the work share between the two uh well that would depend on how you measure it um i would say that probably 90 percent or more of the computation is happening on the gpu Mm -hmm. the vast majority of it what the cpu is doing is figuring out what to draw and importantly, what not to draw, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then submitting all of that to the GPU in the form that GPU can can deal with. Mm-hmm. And the CPU, ideally, never actually touches each vertex mm-hmm. and never actually touches each texture. Now, there are exceptions to that, especially on a machine like the PlayStation 3, where there is a lot more computational capability in the CPUs because then we want to load balance between the two. So we'll move some of the calculations over onto the CPU. Mm-hmm. But fundamentally, the GPU is doing all the work on the vertices and the pixels. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you program GPUs? Can you write C code and run them on the GPU? or how? I mean, it's obviously, they, these things are highly parallelized. So right, you have to have certainly parallel algorithms. Do you also have specialized languages for that? Or is it, uh, is it C++? Well, it's definitely not C++. Um, so when you're programming graphics problems, you're either running uh, DirectX or you're running OpenGL. Right, yeah. In DirectX, there's a language called HLSL, which stands for High Level Shading Language, and it is a very C-like language that's been extended to have uh, very common graphics primitives. So float fours, for example, is a type in the language. And there's a bunch of built-in functions that are commonly used for doing... um, graphics calculations, dot products, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so it's a language carefully tuned to do the sort of calculations that you want to do in your vertex shader or your pixel shader. And that gets compiled down into native 
GPU assembly code, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, in OpenGL, you have GLSL, which yeah. is graphics library shader language. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very similar to HLSL. Okay, let's, um, we, we, we'll come back to the, to the graphics stuff and to the challenge of multi-core and generally parallelization later. Um, let's briefly move on to the audio. And uh, yesterday you mentioned that um, to render, if that's the right word, uh, the audio, the sounds of a car, you had some, sometimes have 27 different kinds of sounds that you mix together to give a, you know, a good audio representation. So there seems to be going on more than I thought in the audio world. Yeah, so I pulled the number 27 out of the air, um, okay. but there are many, and in fact, it might be more than 27 yeah. or different components. Um, there are many different elements that go into a single engine's car sound. And when you consider we have multiple cars happening at the same time, there's a very rich audio environment. In fact, uh, many times at any given moment, there might be a hundred or more sounds being blended together to sort of render your audio canvas, as it were. Um, some of them are so incredibly subtle, you can't pick them out consciously, but it really adds up to a immersive kind of environment. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever watched a movie without audio and then turned on the audio, yeah. you, you realize how massive an impact yeah. the audio environment has on the experience. So it's really crucial. And uh, the Need for Speed team in particular has won numerous awards for years oh, yeah. on, the, on the, the level of audio fidelity they have. So for the engine sounds in particular, we have a uh, internal proprietary technology that I can't really talk about mm. to model how the engine sounds uh, as it revs through the, the range. Um, and it, it really, the emphasis is on engines that rev really quickly because you're in a racing car. Right. You want to hear and feel your engine yeah. screaming through the RPM. And you want to be able to hear when the blow-off valve goes or the turbo goes or that exhaust note as you hit that power band. There's a lot of elements that really go into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess that's something that most people don't think of. I mean, visually, it's obviously impressive. And you, you clearly realize that rendering nice visuals is important. But for the sound, I guess most people don't... I didn't think it was that important. But yeah, And that to no end drives the audio guys crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> okay uh, another thing that goes into games obviously is the gameplay itself how do the well the obvious things is you know if you think about quake how do the opponents behave so there is this ai thing going on is it really ai or is it basically scripted well that's a funny question um in reality in most games it's highly scripted mm -hmm. And to a lot of us, that's kind of disappointing. And 10 years ago, or almost 10 years ago, there was a, a lot of talk about this, uh, what's called emergent behavior. And they mm -hmm. wanted to have all the entities in the game, and they all wanted to have their own behavior. And so you'd get things happening in the game sort of spontaneously that nobody ever, had ever predicted or yep. planned, right? Yep. Um, and then the game designers went, but wait a minute, that means we can't control it all. Mm-hmm. And so they sort of backed away from that and said, no, we want to control the player experience because we want this carefully crafted, right. really highly tuned experience that is very enjoyable. And so it's, it's a strange dichotomy because the, the highly crafted experience is at odds with a smarter AI. Mm -hmm. And so some games really go down the AI path and they try to have smarter algorithms and, and more emergent behavior and that sort of thing. But it's at odds with the story. It's at odds with a carefully crafted experience. So there's a balance mm -hmm. happening there. There's definitely AI controlling the r other opponent racing cars in right. a racing game. Yeah. Right? There is logic in there that's working out how best to drive around the corners. We but, give but, it a lot of hints. But, but they aren't simulated in the sense of you know, what you talked about before with forces and stuff, they are really scripted going around. Or do they, is there also a, a physics simulation engine kind of running for each of the other cars? There's absolutely a physics simulation oh. running for all of the opponent okay. cars. Now, this varies depending on games. And so various racing games right. in the past in the Need for Speed series, there's been a varying degree of physics applied to each of them. And when you encounter traffic, as an optimization, when the traffic's far away, we don't care so much about the physics of the traffic mm -hmm. vehicles, so then they're more scripted. Right. But when they get close, or all the opponent vehicles 
generally are going to be running the full bone physics, and in some of the games, they are in fact controlling the car the same way the players control okay, the car. Yeah. We're actually inventing the steering and the gas right. and the brake inputs mm -hmm. and the shifter controls. And it then goes through the same simulation pipeline. Exactly, and it's running. So if you have eight cars in the race, we have eight different instances of the physics. Engine. So in case anybody ever thought about where your computing power goes, that's added every 18 months, according to Moore's Law, I guess we've just found it. It's games. Yes. <laughs> games and flash, I guess. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. it's impressive. Games have a voracious appetite for, computer, for consuming computing power. Yes, yes. So um, there is also other things that go into a game, the menuing system, the online communication with other players, uh, social media, uh, social, no, social, yeah, social, social networks these, day, these days. I suggest we, we don't cover that too much because it's more or less straightforward and we won't have a lot of time to cover the more interesting stuff. But if you want to say something briefly about that. Um, I mean, I sort of agree. Actually, being in the game and playing the game to me is the really interesting part. And it's a really interesting computational problem. Mm -hmm. um, that said, there's a huge amount of complexity involved in all the social networking and all the online and all these aspects. Online is a fascinating technical problem. How do you deal with latencies and right, bandwidth yes. limitations and whatnot? Yeah. But I agree. It's a huge topic. It's worth a huge amount of discussion. Um, but certainly we're not going to be able to cover it here. So. Right. So then uh, let's move on to some of the, you know, let's, let's dig a little bit deeper into how you build these games. Um, so I guess a starting point is to realize that these, these games and the systems they run on are actually, you could call them real-time embedded systems, right? You have predefined limited resources. And I think yesterday you mentioned that the PS3 has half a gigabyte of RAM only. The PS3 and the Xbox 360 both have 512 megabytes. That's of not a lot. I'm surprised. So, um, so in other words, I guess resource management is one of the main challenges in building such a game. Absolutely. Uh, it's been said many times, at least internally um, at EA, that resource game development is primarily about resource management. We typically have four or five gigabytes of data sitting on a DVD or a Blu-ray disc, um, and somehow we have to use it all in a machine that has one-eighth as much memory mm -hmm. as that. And so there's a lot of loading or streaming or some other marshalling out of it into main memory. And once you get in into main memory, you have to figure out how to manage your available CPU time and your memory bandwidth and all yeah, this other Yeah, and factors. do all of that within one thirtieth or one sixtieth of a second, you know, doing all these different simulation, audio rendering, video rendering, sending it on to the GPU, all the stuff has to happen within, within one, let's say, time slot. Exactly. So it's real time. Exactly. And, and you know, it's, it's soft real time, as I said. Yes, in the keynote, nobody dies. Because yeah. if you miss a frame, it's not the end of the world. Yes. If you miss a frame consistently, it's going to seriously degrade the user experience, though. Yes. So we try to maintain that. And an interesting way to look at 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second is if you're running at 60 frames per second, you have approximately 16 milliseconds, a little over 16 milliseconds, to accomplish everything you need to do in that frame of the game. That's your rendering, your audio, your physics, your animation, taking your inputs. There's a whole lot of stuff, including online and all this other things. Yeah. So that's a lot of work to do in a very short period of time. So let's talk a little bit about the implementation. Which languages do you use mainly? Almost exclusively C++. Okay. And you do that because you like it or because there is no alternative <laughs> that gives you that kind of performance control? Uh, on the game consoles, it turns out that there is no other alternative, really. Mm -hmm. um, Aren't any compilers, probably. That's yeah, exactly. So because the, the Sony and Microsoft are providing us C++ compilers mm -hmm. and no other compilers. <laughs> so, yeah, C++ is it. The reason they're only providing us those things is because there really isn't an alternative language. Yeah. And that means, as a practical matter, all games are written in C++, so all game consoles provide C++, and we're stuck in that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Any... Yeah, I guess that the question is useless then. Any frameworks, tools you use to make your life simpler? I guess since it's all specific to, let's say, the, <coughs> the PS3, there aren't any frameworks or tools that Joe Programmer would know because these are probably not available for these platforms. 
So you have your own frameworks, but nothing like off the shelf. We certainly, within EA, because it's a large company, we have quite a few frameworks of our own. Uh, we also license frameworks. Uh, EA in places has used uh, the Havoc physics engine, mm -hmm. for example, that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And if you go and look in the industry literature, there are various other middleware packages that mm -hmm. you know EA may or may not use, but other game developers yeah. do. I guess one one I w <coughs> we will talk about some design patterns or architecture patterns later, but one as far as I know, one key building block in the way you build your systems is that you do implement the engines uh, in C++, but then the actual uh, the, the scripting of opponents, the actual design of how things look, this is done in, in separate data-driven styles, right? So you, you don't want to change the C++ code if you want to change some parameters of how your opponent drives. Yeah, absolutely. So many systems are at a minimum parameterized heavily, uh, and that sort of scales up to fully data-driven systems. And then in the extreme, we get all the way up to scripting languages. Mm -hmm. So in the game industry, a very common language to embed in a game engine is Lua, for example. Right, yeah, heard about it. And I was actually planning to do an episode about that for years, but never got around <laughs> to do it. <laughs> it is an excellent language because it, it em embeds very, very well. Yeah. And its performance is reasonable. We, we carefully control the scope of what we mm -hmm. use it for, right? Very, very specific tasks that aren't performance intensive. Have basically. you ever thought about using domain specific languages that you build specifically for your kinds of use cases? I mean, one key challenge, we'll talk about it in a minute, is s parallelism. And I'm not sure whether Lua has a lot of very useful abstractions for that. Or maybe it might happen in the C world, but the sta same statement is true. C is not very good for parallel stuff. Have you thought about doing uh, domain specific languages where you maybe even be able to? let's say, flexibly switch between generating C++, which is fast but inflexible, and running it in an interpreted way, which is flexible but slow. Absolutely. Um, and over the last decade or two, um, what has happened is as systems become more and more data-driven, they've eventually gotten to the point where we belatedly realize that they are essentially domain-specific languages. They become data that drives the C++ engine, but they are a limited language. They're not mm -hmm. Turing complete by any stretch, but they are a DSL effectively. But we got there in reverse, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. we, we just progressively parameterized it until, right. hey, guess what? We're almost at a language. <laughs> Rarely do we start at the language side and design backwards. <clears throat> We've done that for gameplay languages on occasion. Sometimes we use Lua, but other times we have internal languages that are purpose-built mm -hmm. for that kind of thing because maybe we don't ha want to have that much generality right. or we want to figure out how to make it perform better than the generic Lua, for example. Um, and certainly it has been a topic uh, internally about can we do any better? Mm -hmm. Can we get performance improvements like rather than, you know, Lua is slow and so try to avoid using it, only using it in strategic places can we actually turn around and create a DSL that gives us a performance win? I have yet to see that happen in practice, but actually the second talk that I gave this morning was essentially about that topic. Mm, okay. And at, I believe it has much broader um, implications to the computing industry in general. I, I'm asking for two reasons. One is that my own area of expertise and work is domain-specific languages, so I'm always interested in that. The other thing is, yesterday morning, I uh, in interviewed uh, Martin Odersky, who does Scala, and he just won a research grant for developing domain-specific languages for really domain-specific concurrency and parallelism as Scala-embedded DSLs. So this topic about DSLs and higher levels of abstraction and more clever libraries and, and translation engines um, is clearly something that, that's on the, on the rise. And so I was just curious. Yeah, and I'm, a, I'm actually a big proponent of that. And at the end of my talk this morning, somebody actually specifically asked about Scala and right. its ability to, or its uh, framework that it provides in order to build DSLs within it. Yeah. Um, I mean, they are, good, I mean, kind of off topic here, but uh, Odersky told me that they are actually going as far as not running the embedded DSLs that are embedded in Scala as Scala programs, but these DSLs just build a syntax tree and then they have a compiler to CUDA or to C to really build completely separate programs. Well, that's very interesting to hear because this yes. morning I was suggesting that they should generate OpenCL. 
Yes. And EA is, in fact, a member of the OpenCL Standards Committee. Yeah. And this is a cross-platform platform that I believe we can target. And it presents a... Um, a tasking model similar mm-hmm. to one of the design patterns that right. we've adopted within right. EA. Yeah. Okay, I guess we should put this to the uh, discussion when we shut down the podcast here. So um, we, you, you, t- you talked about um, concurrency already. So I guess one of the central challenges of what you're doing is multi-core. Not just, I mean, if you're writing a PC game, you have multi-cores in the, in the CPU, but I guess these GPUs are highly parallel parallelized <laughs> already. So any, how do you deal with that? So we've been dealing it with it since the late 90s when uh, GPUs first started to appear on the scene. And the first step was, let's just offload the actual rendering. So back in the mid-90s, we were actually rendering every single pixel as CPU code. Mm-hmm. But when hardware started to become available that would do it for us, that hardware now started to become able to run asynchronously. And that means the CPU sets up the work, hands it over to the GPU, and now you have two processes happening in parallel. Now, that's not the conventional multi-core model, but it definitely gets things happening asynchronously, and you start having to figure out how to partition the work effectively. The arrival of the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360 was a bit of a shock to the system for us because all of a sudden we were confronted with our primary market, the machines in the primary market, having three or six or eight co- mm-hmm. hardware threads. So you had to parallelize existing code, I guess. You didn't rewrite everything. Well, it, it turns out parallelizing existing code is really hard. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so in practice, what we do is we find pieces of a game engine and we extract them out, turn them into tasks. Mm-hmm. And one of the design patterns that we've adopted is a we call it job manager within Mm -hmm. ea but often it's called a task graph or a task manager and what you do is you define a specific piece of a program a kernel a computational kernel if you will and then you schedule that to run on other processors right so your mainline code decides there's a bunch of work that has to be done puts it in a queue to get done and then the work processors such as the SPUs that are found in the cell processor in the PlayStation 3 are constantly pulling work off of those queues. Mm-hmm. And then you just have to manage that the queue doesn't get too big and stays on and then you know that it's actually... Working. That's right. And then sometimes you have to pick up the results as they come right. back. Although some tasks just go to the GPU and they never actually come back to the CPU. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, another design pattern, since we're already talking about it, um, you mentioned yesterday are these vector-based interfaces. So if I get it correctly, you can let me know if I do or if I don't. Uh, instead of saying, here is an object, I call a method. You say, here is a bunch of objects. I want the following method to be executed on each of them. And then some lower level can find out whether there is only one core or thread to do it sequentially or several do it in parallel. Is that kind of right? That's kind of right. Um, part of the problem we're trying to solve here is you don't just get concurrency from having multiple processors. Individual processors, individual threads, hardware threads, um, have concurrency within them. Mm-hmm. Some of that shows up as SIMD instructions. Some of it just shows up as um, pipelining and overlapping instructions and concurrent memory accesses. So there's all these different elements of parallelism and when i talk about it i tend to use the label vectorization Mm. when you're going to optimize for this kind of concurrency that's at the instruction level i just lump that into it and call it vectorization and so when you take an algorithm and you vectorize you're trying to take advantage of all the concurrency that you can get at the instruction level at the memory organization level simultaneous transactions on the bus because things can overlap Mm. on the memory bus and that kind of thing once you get all that sorted out um, we, we find that uh, many algorithms, data parallel algorithms at least, we can get a 10 times performance speed up by doing that sort of optimization. The problem is, if you haven't designed your software to do a lot of the same calculation to the same kind of objects all at once in mm-hmm, a batch, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you can't apply those sort of right. optimizations. So if um, uh, an example I use all the time is culling, which is essentially the process of deciding what to draw and not to draw. Mm -hmm. So if you have thousands of things to draw, but you can only afford to draw a few hundred, you have to quickly toss out, toss away the things that don't need to be drawn because they're not in the view frame or Mm -hmm. whatever. 
that process can be quite expensive. And if you walk through your graph of objects and as you hit each object, you say, oh, call your call method to see if you're visible or not. And then it goes through this call yeah, chain yeah. and eventually it says, what's the view frustrum? What's my bounding box? Do the calculation to see if it's visible. If you do that thousands and thousands of times at 60 frames per second, <laughs> you find you quickly use up all your CPU. You wait 18 months to get a faster one. Yeah. And we just don't have that option. And yeah. in fact, single processors aren't getting yes. that much faster anymore. And also, the game consoles haven't been, uh, uh, you know, changed much in the last six or seven years anyway. I mean, the, the Microsoft Xbox is ages old, I think. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, our console generations last six to ten years, right, or whatever yeah. they last. And so we have to get faster and faster on a given machine. And that means that what you really need to do is you need to identify the large pieces of work and you need to batch up the calculation. And once you have it all as, instead of going through a thousand objects and individually calling them, what you want to do is you want to have a thousand unbounding boxes all at once. Mm. And then you can write one high-performance algorithm that all at once does a thousand bounding boxes mm. or whatever your calculation that is. That does destroy the object-oriented purity of your uh, object model a little bit because you have to, you know, Define different kinds of interfaces. Absolutely, yeah. uh, and not just a little bit, but it can it can completely <laughs> yeah. derail right. your your object right. oriented right. design. Right. 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 Yeah. Another challenge, I imagine, you mentioned PS3, Xbox, PCs. How do you get the platform independence? Is C plus plus good enough to kind of transparently do that? Or um, or also, I mean, I guess the the parallel nature. I mean, some have several cores, others don't. So you have to even have different ways of parallelizing things depending on the platform. How do you handle that? This is where the 80-20 rule comes to the rescue. So the, the, the basic rule of thumb is 80% of your performance happens in 20% of your code. Mm -hmm. That means the other 80% of the code isn't especially performance intensive. Right. So you write it in C++. You try to make sure you don't do anything platform specific. And for the most part, it ports pretty well to okay. all the games. And maybe you provide a layer of, like of portable uh, libraries yeah, okay. to hide differences between file okay. systems and memory management and okay. all that sort of stuff. Okay. That 20% that's performance intensive, um, typically you're going to do different versions for every mm -hmm. platform. Okay. And there might be some tools that help <coughs> us stay agnostic to mm -hmm. the platform. But yeah, there's going to be a fair bit of of machine-specific tuning. And of course, all the stuff you do with your DSLs and data-driven kind of stuff is obviously platform-independent anyway, so that's not a big deal. Well, the implementation of the DSL, if that's what you yeah, want sure. to call it, may be tuned for every platform. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's look at a couple of more of these patterns you've uh, found or implemented or used. And I guess <coughs> one pattern you, I think, didn't explicitly mention yesterday but which i kind of it jumped like into my eyes this whole rendering pipeline kind of thing is obviously pipes and filters right i mean this is just one step create something that's piped to the next filter or stage which is then piped to the next one right well you would think okay <laughs> see i um, didn't think so <laughs> different rendering <laughs> engines take a uh, a different approach to these things but uh generally the rendering is broken down into you're rendering different surfaces so For example, you might render a environment map. And what that really is, is it's a separate rendering of the world from the point of view of being inside a shiny object, mm -hmm. a car, for example. So you, you choose a wide-angle lens and you render the world in a low resolution of detail. So now you have this picture of, this, of the world that's around <coughs> the car. And then once that's rendered, you use it as a texture that you then feed into a later rendering pass when you're actually going to draw the car that mm -hmm. the user is going to see and you use that reflection in your pixel shaders to reflect the world. So mm -hmm. that so mm -hmm. when you're looking at the car, you can actually see the buildings that are going by and it makes yep. the car look like it's in the world. And so it's kind of like piping from one stage to the other um, but it's not actually done using that sort of terminology or that sort okay. of mechanism mm -hmm. in the in any rendering engine I've seen. So then I guess um, we should look at some of the patterns you, you do use. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's easy for me to name those because they were on your slides. One of them was the sim 
simulation presentation split. That sounds like model view controller. It is quite similar to model view controller. Um, you have the simulation, and it's essentially updating the game state. And so you run the simulation for one frame, and now you have in some form another sitting in memory, maybe spread throughout memory, but you have this state of your simulation world. And the job of the presentation is to render that both audio and graphically and to, f to force feedback on the controllers. Mm -hmm. So games that are using this pattern we've discovered um, – have a fairly formal split between those two halves, and they try to carefully control the data that passes between them so that this data can be captured, can be used for a replay, for example. Mm -hmm. um, plus, because the two are decoupled like that, once the simulation finishes doing its calculation, it hands this nice little package of data over to presentation, and then it can, because the program is concurrent on mm -hmm. multiple threads, the simulation can carry on with the next frame and thus you're overlapping mm -hmm. the calculation of the next frame with the rendering of the current frame. And you get parallelism at a coarse grain level out of mm -hmm. that. And everybody's busy all the time. Exactly. Another one you mentioned is services. I don't remember what it was actually. Yeah, so services are like an animation service or a rendering service or an audio service. And so they're essentially just singletons in the program. Oh, mm -hmm. They are factories for managing the kind of objects that you would have um, in any given subsystem so the you know the physics service manages rigid bodies for example right okay another one is the data driven system stuff which we already talked about yep um we already talked about job manager and vector based interfaces yep the last one i wrote down was the pre baked data yeah the key here is any computation that you don't have to do while the game is running is a computation you don't have to do while the game is running. It's mm -hmm. a pretty simple concept. Yes. <laughs> so basically it says, if we can pre-calculate stuff, and uh, my favorite example here is lighting information. So a lot of games have fairly intricate lighting, and sometimes the um, the calculations that go into lighting can be very, very intensive. Uh, one of our games, the lighting calculation to light the entire world would run for three days on high-end PCs. So you can't do that in real time on yeah. any machine, yeah. much less on a $500 game console or $300 now because they've all come down in price. But So what we do is we pre-calculate it all, we store it in highly optimized data structures, and then we bring it in off of disk and we feed that pre-calculated data to the, to the rendering engines. It's not all completely canned. There's still some dynamic calculations happening based on that. Um, but the idea is get your data into exactly the form that the game machine needs it rather than a more generalized form. And, and an extreme example of that is we often pre-bake data to the point where we can literally take the file that's sitting on disk, copy it into memory, and begin using it immediately. Mm -hmm. There's no serialization or deserialization. So it's a direct stuff. memory image. Direct memory image sitting on the disk. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a bit of tweaking we want to do, fixing up pointers mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But by and large, the closer we can get it to the memory resident image, the better. Because then you just issue a read to the disk, the operating system delivers the block of whatever megabytes, mm. and you get a pointer to the beginning of it, and quite often you can just pass that straight to the GPU and it starts drawing. Right. One thing you showed yesterday is also the um, the skateboard guy driving around on his skateboard. Yep. And... Um, I wonder how the movements actually are kind of diverting back to the uh, you know to the simulation thing here um how the the guy who rides the skateboard is rendered is that described algorithmically or do you use motion capture or something like that so first of all what do you mean by rendered uh, wrong word finding out how he moves simulate right okay so uh in skate it was a combination of pre-recorded <coughs> Uh, motion captured animation. So motion capture is a process whereby you get an actual human actor, you put him in a funny black suit with white <laughs> markers all over him, and then you have special cameras that track those white markers, and he goes and he does the moves. So we have a motion capture studio at uh, EA in Vancouver, and we've had all sorts of football players and American football players and baseball players and golfers I think we had Tiger Woods in once a while back. <laughs> um, and skateboarding, we had the skateboarders, and they come in and they 
they do the various moves that we want to represent in the game. We have cameras from all sorts of angles, mm -hmm. and we capture the data, and a whole bunch of software does a lot of pre-processing, and it turns it into 3D data. Then we take that animation data, and we build up a database. And in the game, when a player wants to run in a straight line and then turn right, we go and look in the database, and we mm -hmm. find run in a straight line, and we find turn right, and we can play these things back. And then and there's all sorts of techniques to blend yeah. from one animation to another, or combine them in different ways. So maybe his legs are running and his upper body is doing something yeah. different, like shooting a gun. In the demo yesterday, it looked pretty good, although I thought it was a little bit um, too fast, if that's the right word. It, 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 it seemed to me as if the bodies that moved weren't massive enough. You know, some of the... Uh, what's the word? Uh, Trägheit in German. Uh, inertia, right. It it felt like that was a little bit, it felt like it was a, bit, a little bit too light somehow. I don't know. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. And it's a, it's a really finicky tuning issue when, yes. when building games because you want to have fast action and you, and very rapid response to, to user input. Um, but there's a trade-off. If it's too fast, then it feels like it's too light or too maneuverable. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah, yeah. And so th there is a real gameplay balance going on. It's one on of these there. realistic versus funny or e fun. E exactly. Right, yeah. okay. So let's briefly talk about the process you use to develop these games. I mean, there's probably a couple dozens of people at least involved in this game. And I guess um, you also have like stakeholders who are not programmers, like artists and, 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 and things like that, or people like that. I imagine those being quite interesting as customers from a programmer's perspective. Yeah, it makes for very uh, interesting and dynamic uh, <laughs> teams. And, yes. and it's, it's a hugely creative and productive environment. Um, I have a hard time imagining what a team of just software engineers is like after spending so long mm -hmm. in the game business. Um, because as a group, software engineers are typically quite left-brained. Mm -hmm. right? They're very logical and methodical. and You would hope so, at least. You would hope so. <laughs> Artists, on the other hand, are much more right-brained. They're much more uh, holistic and visual, and their approach to problems is very, very different. And you bring these groups of people together, and at times they clash. They mm -hmm. just don't understand each other. Mm -hmm. But once you get a team that is meshed together and working effectively, it's intensely creative because these, they're complementary skill sets. And so it's a, it's a great environment. Um, for the games we've been talking about, the team sizes are typically anything from 20 to 50 engineers or 20 to 60 engineers, um, at least that many artists. Modern games for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 are extremely content heavy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the the amount it's of... It's more like a movie already almost. Absolutely. And the amount of people you need to build all of that content. I mean, you know, every single building you see next to the racetrack the racetrack itself, all this data, all the, the textures that go on the polygonal models, all of this stuff has to be created out of mm -hmm. essentially whole cloth. And that just takes a really large team. And then you have animators who mm -hmm. are responsible for tuning the animations that come out of the motion capture studio. You have the people in the motion capture studio. You have our, uh, audio people that are generating the sound effects, like the skateboard going across mm -hmm. the sidewalk, mm -hmm. or the engine sounds, and you have guys that go out and record the sounds of actual car engines, and uh, they have all sorts of stories about you know flying over to Europe and going into Ferrari and getting <laughs> sounds of the latest <laughs> and greatest engines. <laughs> Those lucky guys. I wish I could go. <laughs> but yeah. uh, so there's all different parts of the team, and so I think at the largest Need for Speed team I saw, it was approaching 200 people. And it mm -hmm. depends on where you define the boundaries. Sure. So if you include marketing people and, sure. and all sorts of yeah. others, it can be quite a large team. So I guess then the, the distinction between the engine in C++ and the data-driven higher-level stuff and maybe the runtime tunable parameters is also a way to decouple these kinds of people at least a little bit. So you don't have to have the C++ programmer involved whenever the artist says, you know, this guy needs to move a little bit faster or a little bit slower or something. Sometimes I wish we were more decoupled, mm -hmm. but um, yes, absolutely. The reason that you want to expose those parameters is because the key to building a good game is rapid iteration because what there's no magic formula that mm -hmm. makes a great game. And what you want to be able to do is try things rapidly. And 
by trying things rapidly, that means you get to experiment with what works better. Mm -hmm. And so there's a rule of thumb that basically says the more times you can iterate, Mm -hmm, the the better. better. And that means speeding up the iteration time. Mm -hmm. As a programmer, think about it as your compile link run cycle. The faster that is, the more times you can you can find and, and fix bugs and you can refine your code and make it perform better. It's the same thing with game design. You right. can go in and you can refine the art and the gameplay and all the different aspects. Yeah. So by exposing tunable parameters, especially those tunable parameters which can be done during gameplay, like ideally mm-hmm. while the guy is driving the car around, mm-hmm. he can be changing the coefficient of friction on mm-hmm. the tires mm-hmm. so he gets mm-hmm. the right feel of it. Right. If he can just keep driving around the track yeah. and he never has to quit the game. And rebuild and redeploy. Right. <laughs> you don't want to do yes. any of that stuff because uh, sure, it can take a very long time. Yes. So ideally, while the game is running, you can s- tweak all those parameters yeah. and get just perfect. Yeah. So we have to leave this room in about five minutes. So and we're almost through anyway. Okay. So um, last question. How do you think will games look in five or ten years? I mean, it's obviously, obviously a question you get a lot of many times. But uh, still, I mean, what do you think... Except, of course, you know, frame rate, frame, rate, frame rate will get higher, level of detail will get higher. Is there any fundamental change coming, or is it just going to be everything is better? 500 different sounds. So, first of all, I don't know that I agree with that. I okay. Don't, frame rate at 30 or 60, there's not really no, much reason right, to go higher. Okay. So, mm. we're, we're well, pretty much resolution. at a good point. Resolution might go higher, but really we're aiming at HDTVs. Mm. We don't expect to see a lot of resolution increases okay. there. So there will be some increase in fidelity, but we've already hit a point of diminishing returns, mm-hmm. right? We're at a point where if you double the computational power we can throw at the graphics, we haven't made it look twice as good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In fact, this last generation was a bit of a struggle for us because we're at that point of diminishing returns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they do look better. Yeah, they are in higher res, but what's the next generation going to include? And My speculation is we're going to see the differences in behavior. It's going to move better. It's going to do things smarter. It's going to Mm -hmm. behave in more believable ways. And that's going to be a challenge because it's easy to sell graphics. Right. Right. You can show a screenshot and say, look how much better that looks. But behavior, you can't show screenshots. Right. And it's a more subtle effect. So I think it will lead to better gameplay. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's going to be a hard, it's going to be a hard story to sell to the consumer. Mm-hmm. Why? What's the improvement? You here? can do 3D games, you know. I mean, really 3D with the glasses and stuff. And our games are doing 3D, yeah, and yeah. and you know, performance improvements will help there because essentially right. you have to re- render Two. the scene twice. Right. So exactly. Okay, um, I think we're through. Anything else you want to say? You know, like famous last words uh, or whatever at the end. Uh, I've had a great time in Munich. This is a beautiful city, and I'm uh, very happy to have had a chance to visit. Good. Great. And I'm happy to have had you or going to have you on SE Radio. It was a very nice conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. SE Radio is an educational program brought to you by Hillside Europe. If you want more information about the podcast and the other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. If you want to support us, you can donate to the SE Radio team via the website, or you can advertise for SE Radio, for example, by clicking on the Dick Reddit Delicious and Slashdot buttons, or by talking about us on Twitter and Facebook. You can also support us by joining the team and shouldering some of the work. To contact the team, please send email to team at se-radio.net. Or, if your feedback is specific to an episode, please use the comments facility on the website so other people can react to your comments. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, are licensed under a Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details.